Tonight on Special Assignment, we bring you a behind-the-scenes report on South Africa's heroic race against time to stop the outbreak of one of the world's most contagious animal diseases. Normally found only in the Kruger National Park, foot and mouth disease has not been seen in the rest of South Africa for more than 40 years. This is the first sign that something's wrong in KwaZulu-Natal. A massive control program is underway to stop a disease that strikes fear in farmers' hearts. Foot and mouth disease doesn't affect humans, but the effect on animals is catastrophic. It's highly contagious and can infect entire herds of livestock. The impact on the farming industry can be devastating. All these people from across South Africa have been called to battle against this disease. It began here a little more than six weeks ago on this farm near Camperdown outside Peter Maritzburg. Foot and mouth disease was diagnosed after 70 pigs died mysteriously. It was a strain never seen before in South Africa, type O. It's suspected that the virus came into the country in kitchen waste or floated from a ship in Durban Harbour in these containers. The contaminated swill was fed to pigs. Foot and mouth is the most feared animal disease in the world affecting pigs, cattle, goats and sheep. It spreads incredibly quickly, especially amongst pigs. Animals get blister-like lesions around the mouth and hooves. It makes intensive farming uneconomical. Developed countries are quick to ban imports from infected countries. This makes a speedy response crucial. The outbreak on Farm 1 set in motion a dramatic sequence of events. Louine Edwards and her right-hand man, Kevin LaRue, were the first team on the scene. We got to a, pit, a particular pen where there were a lot of uh, little pigs, and those big pigs were in a pretty bad state. We brought pigs to Allerton, so we did pulse mortems on five pigs. It was only the next morning that we started su uh, suspecting foot and mouth disease. We, we had to take everything we did from them very seriously, like disinfecting of samples and hands and feet and so on. Disinfecting Just, our office. <laughs> yes. Even the suspicion of, of a disease like this is enough to start you know, implementing sort of control measures to stop it spreading. We knew then that it was really, really serious and then everything sort of kicked into gear. Right, focus areas. An immediate quarantine zone of 10 kilometers was set up around the infected farm with a total ban on the movement of animals or animal products. Around that area, a further surveillance zone of 20 kilometers. Reinforcements were called in from across the country. Dr. Gideon Bruckner, the National Director of Veterinary Services, together with his provincial counterparts, Dr. Brian Weaver and Dr. Roger Horner, were to head the massive control effort that was about to swing into action. Well, the, the sense of urgency with regard to foot and mouth disease is as, as extreme as it can be because it is probably one of the most important diseases of livestock throughout the world. So as soon as you get a confirmation of foot and mouth disease, it literally means top priority all round. But the fact that it's so highly contagious, countries are, that do not have the disease are very, very wary to reintroduce or introduce the disease in that country because that will affect their trade immediately. To get yourself blacklisted is certainly not the thing that we want to know. Uh, so, so, so people must appreciate that this goes wider than just uh, South Africa or KwaZulu-Natal. It, it has, uh, you know, impact on, on the rest of the world. O900 hours. Joint Operations Centre, Peter Maritzburg. This is the first of two daily briefings. 
For the past four weeks, this has been the on-site nerve center of the disease containment program. Here, farmers, vets, technicians, government officials, police, traffic officers and the army discuss the latest updates from the field. 49, 49, 49, Jock. Jock, okay, that lieutenant and that other captain, uh, 39, are they coming in with you? Driving this huge logistical machine that oversees all field actions is Colonel Francois Schroeder. We are used to uh, big scale operations like this. We are used to organizing and coordinating big efforts, especially where there's other role players uh, involved as well. It's not something that we have to go and learn to do. Uh, it is within the scope of our deployment and in terms of what we are there for. The heart of the control program focused on stopping the spread of the virus. At this stage, nobody knew if the virus had escaped from Farm 1, and nobody was taking any chances. To enforce the quarantine, 20 roadblocks and decontamination checks operated around the clock. From across the country, teams of vets and animal health technicians reported for duty. Amongst them, Dr. Tiro Modungwa from the Free State. They were immediately deployed to inspect every last cloven-hoofed animal in the zone. They fanned out, taking blood and tissue samples. With an incubation period of seven days, time was of the essence. At the provincial laboratory in Allerton, control technician Butch Bosch prepared the huge volume of samples coming in. From here, they would be dispatched to the Onderstepoort Veterinary Institute in Pretoria, where the foot and mouth team was on full alert. SA Airlink flew the samples free of charge to Johannesburg. A little more than an hour after being loaded onto the plane in Peter Maritzburg, the samples were handed to the quarantine master on the airport apron. From here, they were rushed to Pretoria. 40 minutes on the highway, and the consignment was at last safely in the hands of the laboratory team. Every sample carried the threat of a fresh crisis. Laboratory teams worked through the night to get their findings to Peter Maritzburg. For most of these technicians, it was their first experience of a foot and mouth outbreak in South Africa's free zone. Back in Peter Maritzburg, the waiting game was on. At this decontamination point near the infected farm, Every human body and every vehicle carried the threat of spreading the virus beyond the zone. Feet and wheels were disinfected. From here, two further checkpoints would do the same. We have just come out of the no-go zone from one of the infected farms. I am now going to go through decontamination. I will enter this tent, my clothes will be removed and destroyed or washed and disinfected, and I will go through a disinfected decontamination shower. Then disaster struck. Almost a week after the first outbreak, Onnerstepoort found a second batch of positive samples. The disease had jumped onto the farm next door. And he said, it's positive, what's your result? And we said, no, wait for another hour, then we will see. So it was quite exciting now. And then the typing came and it said, it's type O. And everything was again, you know, what we usually say, like screaming positive. Because there was just so much virus in that sample that there was no doubt in our minds that it had been spread um, onto the next farm. Once you diagnose the disease, it's got such enormous ramifications that you have to be extremely sure about your diagnosis. The team in Peter Maritzburg knew what these ramifications were. The scientists knew that now things had to be done by the book. Traumatic decisions were at hand. 
as shown in this University of Pretoria and Onderstapoort Veterinary Institute training video. There are two fundamental approaches. The first is so-called stamping out, where in the event of a localized outbreak, all the infected animals and those in direct contact with them are killed in situ. It, it was a very difficult decision to make, but we realized that uh, if we want to put into place proper risk management, that is to exclude the risk factors that might still cause spread of disease, we had to do it. If it's going to be some control system, you've got to cater for all those people. Plus the, all the people where Quarantine alone was no longer an option. All cloven-hoofed animals on the second infected farm had to be killed and buried immediately. All in all about 60 stud cattle and more than 2,500 pigs. In order to stay ahead of the virus, another hard decision was taken. To create a low risk area around the infection, all the pigs, goats, sheep and cattle in a three kilometer radius around the farm were also to be stamped out. They were given forms that they had to fill in, which in effect they were handing over the farm to the National Director of Veterinary Services and they had to sign those forms. We did a final stock count with the people. We got the contact telephone numbers, etc. And then it was really a question of saying, we're going to be back in 48, 72 hours time. zone around the epicenter of the outbreak. Here all cloven hoofed animals will be put down including those behind me. This is a small holding, many of these animals are pets. It's an incredibly emotional time for farmers and for workers as they see their livelihood being destroyed. It is however according to veterinary services a crucial part of the containment program. This farmer watches bravely as his animals are killed before being taken to a central burial site. When the teams moved in his wife took the little son off the farm. That morning, the little boy had asked if they could hide his two pet calves in the house. I think they had four animals. And then at this farm particularly, we were going to put down the animals. So they were like crying and then they rushed into the house. So you don't want to cause, well, to exacerbate the condition by following them and wanting to comfort them. So you just let them go into the house and cry. There was nothing I could do. Alles is weg. We gaan ons weer naar Good Gatridge, the animal farm. Maar dit zal gauw gaan, hoor. Nee, maar zie je toch, alles is klaar, dus ik kiet op uit plaats, nee. Nee, ik vraag gesel, maar nie nou skiet nie, want die goed leer langs die pad. En ons is nie reg om te laar, die lorries is nog nie so langs aan by hom nie. So, dra die eerste lorry klaar is, kan hy oorgaan met die eerste luider, dan skiet ons gauw. Dit is gauw daar, hulle is alle teer die pad, hoor. It's not easy to go to a farmer and tell him that you must do a certain thing for a certain purpose. And I think it was very traumatic for the farmers that I went to, but I think they all knew we had to do that. And they, I think the spirit, especially on yesterday when we, and Saturday when we had to kill all these other cattle, it was, it was really traumatic. But the cooperation and the acceptance of the people that they part and parcel of things that need to be done, I think that's highly commendable. For two days, the culling teams moved from farm to farm, with the army giving logistical support. 
The aim to create a low risk area with no cloven hoofed animals in the vicinity of the infected farms. At the central burial site, the workers work through the night to process the carcasses. They were cut open and then covered in lime and disinfectant. You know, after, after a while, you can never get used to killing animals, but it becomes a job. It becomes like inoculating. You know what you're doing is, is for a good purpose. And, and so for us, it, it was a sort of a job that we had to do, and we, we didn't really mind doing it, though sometimes it left you a bit hollow. But the, that trauma that the farmers had to go through, losing some of their friends, uh, that was hard. Well, I found it traumatic because we trained to treat to save animals and to control diseases, not to just kill. So it was mass killing. And it was, I think it was very traumatic. But we, we, we tried to keep each other going. <laughs> it reminded me a bit about being in the military again. It was the whole day I was just giving orders. Do this, do that, clean this, take this, carry this down there, the whole day. And not for a single moment did any of them complain. And uh, I'm really thankful for that. They were really amazing. Days after the culling, the terrible loss was evident. I was absolutely distraught. I, I was absolutely distraught. Absolutely distraught. There's no word for it. We have very little to say. What can we say? We're not the authority. We're not specialists. We, we were not taken into that meeting. We don't know. We don't know what was best. We, we did what was best for everybody else. It was not best for us, but it was for the rest of the community to make sure that this disease doesn't go somewhere else. Yes, I left the farm. I couldn't, I couldn't face it. I left the farm. My son phoned me at about three o'clock and he says, uh, it's over, you can come back. My first animal coming back here will be called Hope. And the second one will be called Faith. And the third one will be called Determination because we are determined to get over this. It was Vainant van Dijk who was hardest hit. He lost more than 2,500 pigs, but it was the loss of his prized cattle that left him shell-shocked. Look, I'm horrified because I love those animals. They're not just uh, normal animals. They, 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 they red angered stud animals, which I've been building up for, for, for a number of years. And uh, I know them by name. They're like my babies. So I didn't want to believe. I thought maybe it's something else. I thought uh, it's maybe lantana poisoning or something like which has got similar symptoms. But unfortunately, when they send the samples away, we knew the next day already that it, it's positively food and mouth disease. We also discussed, isn't there a possibility so we can keep the animals and, and, and doctor them and, 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 uh, and, and get them right again. But because of the international pressure and, 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 and the problem with the disease, the decision was taken now, we, we have to cull all the animals. That's all gone now. And we suppose we're going to have to start again. On Vainon's farm, the empty pig pens are a cruel reminder of his once thriving business. Even the stockpiled animal feed had to be destroyed. As the decontamination teams disinfect every nook and cranny, he knows he can only start thinking of farming again next year. But back at the Joint Operations Center, more decisions had to be made. To shoot maybe uh, three different species of wild animals to test them as well. That was from your side, Kilo. Yeah, so okay, we can do that maybe tonight. We wanted to go and do a surveillance bleed on this game farm, which is on the perimeter of the 10 kilometer quarantine zone. That's merely a precautionary surveillance. Bosch tested warthogs and antelope, the cloven hoofed animals of the wild. These tests would later come back negative. 
we just haven't had it for about 40 years outside the red line area. So it's really surprising. It's been quite shocking. Um, but it's also been a good experience because it's shown us that you know, we can all handle it. Field services can handle it and the laboratory can handle it. Rumours abound of stray animals hidden from the culling teams. Every story had to be checked out. In the days following the culling, there's intensive aerial surveillance of the new low-risk area. Scientists also had to check for the hidden danger of wind spreading the virus. I think we're all tired. I think the critical thing was in that first seven days when it rained, everything was not in our favour. Every single crisis happened, it was on a weekend. But there are people here that worked through four or five days without stop. And they're the people that really work hard. We all try to do what we have to do just to contain disease. So there are people, our animal health technicians especially, were the people that really went up full out. And they're people that, that know this type of thing and they know what has to be done. Johan Shaw from Pretoria is one of the countless animal health technicians who are the unsung heroes of the battle against the virus. He prefers the field, but here everyone goes where they need it most. Johan handles the storeroom where he's coordinated the massive logistical needs of field teams. Overalls, gumboots, testing kits, disinfectant sprays, washing powder. Op die oomlik is allemaal redelijk moeg. Maar, soos ek sê, ons is allemaal gemotiveerd, en ek praat nou van met die technicie wat ek ook met die kontak het, baie gemotiveerd, die idee is natuurlijk om die back and cloud uitgeweek te kry. Iere maak nie by ons op die stadium saak nie. Day after day, dedicated teams go through their paces. These fencing specialists came all the way from the far northern province. Until it's over, everyone, from soldiers to civilians, from police to vets, from technicians to cooks, will do their bit in what has become a special form of national service. Well, it was really amazing. The South Africanness in all of us uh, really emerged during that crisis. And uh, you know, if one has to talk about a rainbow nation and building of a nation, this exercise certainly brought out nation building in all of us. No, I'm, I'm very impressed with what the people have done here. You can see there's good integration, as Dr. Brooklyn said, with the security forces uh, and all sorts of logistical support. I, I'm, I'm very impressed the way it's been approached and uh, the success which has so far been achieved. Whether it's totally uh, a success at this stage is difficult to say, but all the signs are there that it is. But what is the price of failure? We'd lose our status as a foot and mouth free zone. Blacklisting would follow, a ban on all agricultural produce that could cost us more than two billion rand a year. But for now, knowing how the virus came into the country and who is responsible is the crucial next step. If ever the source of the infection came in through importation or illegal importation, we need to determine that. There might be a possibility that we are getting a different form of a virus, you know, an outbreak throughout the world. Because there are outbreaks in Japan, Korea, Mongolia, uh, Brazil, Argentina and Colombia. This is the final checkpoint inside the three kilometer no-go zone next to the two farms where the outbreak occurred. Behind me you can see the partially covered graves where the culled animals were disposed of. What will happen now is that the army will move in, these graves will be covered with wire and patrolled to ensure that the contaminated meat is not removed. And then the waiting game begins. In the meantime, the tireless work is far from over. Dr. Dumisanin Charlie heads up the extension services to the rural areas. His work may only be starting. We shall be getting onto the plane and drop the Zulu pamphlets for the community to be able to read what our intentions, what we are trying to do. They are extremely worried. They want to find out for how long will they be living under the circumstances that they've been subjected to. And that is difficult to tell until we know what is the last infection that we, we picked up and then it's only then that we shall be able to tell them we shall be in the process for so many number of days and thereafter they'll be going back to their normal life. But last week a third infection inside the 10 kilometer quarantine zone was identified. Another 16 cattle and four goats were put down. Since then samples continued testing negative. In Camperdown, the containment program goes on.
Join us again next week for another special assignment. And if you have any comments or suggestions, you can email us at truth at sabc.co.za.